The Club Championship Show on Off The Ball in partnership with AIB, proud sponsor of the Football, Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest. You are very welcome along to the Club Championship Show. It is All-Ireland Senior Final Weekend. The show is brought to you by AIB, the main sponsors of the All-Ireland Club Championships in Football, Hurling and in Camogie as well. Check out the hashtag the toughest ahead of this weekend because we've got the Andy American Cup and the Tommy Moore Cup both up for grabs at Croke Park on Sunday afternoon. Uh, go away St. Thomas's and Roscommon St. Bridges. We're hoping it's a repeat of St. Patrick's Day of 2013 when they both brought the Cups west of the Shannon on that day. They're back in the final again. Standing in the way of St. Thomas are a team who've been very impressive, particularly in clutch situations this year. O'Loughlin Gales of Kilkenny, the new Leinster champions who dethroned the reigning All-Ireland champions Ballahale Shamrocks in the Kilkenny final with a late winner as well. St. Bridget's will be facing off against last year's beaten finalists, the Derry and Ulster Kingpins Glen, who avenged their defeat in last year's final in the semi-finals in the Fog of Norrie a couple of weeks ago against Kilmacook Croaks. Delighted to say we've got off the balls GA correspondent Tommy Rooney with us for the show today. We will be speaking to the sideline supremo in Finton Burke of St. Thomas a little bit later on. But delighted to say we're joined by Glen's all-star midfielder Connor Glass as well. Lads, how are you getting on? Keeping well, hey, well keeping well. Hey, Connor. Or no Connor, we got to go with you as the uh, the special guest a few days out now from an All Ireland final. Uh, just we were thinking on last week's show, it's been just a remarkable run of long years that you've had since you came back from Australia. You come back in in 2020, and we had the pandemic in the late season that carried around the clock there. Since then, Derry have gone to Division One of the National Football League. You've won a couple of Ulster titles with club and with county. You've collected an All Star along the way, and you've played in an All Ireland semi final. Pretty much since you touched down, you've been going around the clock for the last two, three seasons. Yeah, hundred percent. And here, look at them, absolutely loving it. Uh, the body's feeling good, and the mind's feeling fresh. So, um, success has been a part in that. Um, maybe if we weren't winning, um, it would be a lot tougher. But yeah, I'm just happy to be on the pitch, and I'm enjoying fo- enjoying my football at the minute, which is the main thing. And and um, hopefully, this weekend will be a good day out for the community. Yeah, Brendan Rogers was saying on the TV just before Christmas that he reckoned when you came back from Hawthorne, one of the things you probably brought was maybe a different perspective around your leadership and your communication with the team. In your four or five years in Australia, what did you learn from that kind of aspect? And is he is he right in his conclusion as to what's the, what's changed since you came back? Um, here, look at it's been in a professional environment will obviously will obviously help um, your knowledge of to deal with certain situations. Um, Rogers, <laughs> I can't really put it down to myself to change a way a lot. Like I didn't change a way a lot. Um, just in terms of dealing with the younger players or dealing with certain scenarios, as I said, I'm, I'm trying to put my spin on things, taken from a different sport. Um, and thankfully that's worked for us for the last couple of years. In terms of a leader, um, I don't do a while, a lot of talking, to be honest. I, uh, I act more on my, on my actions. Um, and I'll leave the, the talking up to Chrissy because he can talk forever. So I'll leave that up to him. Right. We'll put the focus on to Glenn then. I mean, the year that you've had coming into this season, it's always difficult for a team who gets to an All-Ireland final and misses out ultimately on the big day because you have to reset, go back into a very difficult county championship in Derry itself to try and win that. And we know how cutthroat Ulster can be. And then to get back to this phase, you've had to beat Kilmacher Crokes in the All-Ireland semi-final as well. Like, what was the refocus like after coming up so close to actually winning the championship last year? The refocus, um, it, was, it was a tough few months, to be honest, afterwards. Um, any defeat is tough, but losing an all Ireland Club final in the, way, in the way which we did uh, was a tough one to swallow. Uh, we, we took all of the club players I'm, I'm talking about here. They probably took two or three months off. Uh, a lot of boys went away to, to recharge the batteries a bit. Unfortunately, I, well, not unfortunately, I, I decided to go back with Derry and that was my coping mechanism to, to just go straight back into football. Um, but the focus was solely focused, it was, all, it was on Derry, it was on the Derry Championship, really. Um, as you said, it was a highly competitive campaign um, and so was, so was Ulster. So if we had that focus of let's get back to the Ireland final and have an hour crack croaks, um, we would have been caught in the hop in Derry, never mind Ulster. Yeah, it was step by step. I, I remember as well, you were straight out for Derry in the league very soon after the final. So in a way, kind of while all the Ferrari was going around and the potential of an appeal and all that type of stuff, you, I presume, were right back at county training, so your focus had kind of switched to that point. 
I went back to County on the Thursday night following the, the Sunday game, yeah, and played for Derry against, I think it was Cork or Clare we played up the Old Bay. Um, as I said, that was my, my coping mechanism. Um, Ethan Doherty the same. Um, there was so much going up in the air of, is there going to be a replay? What's what's going to happen? Um, so we felt like our best way to deal with it was to go back, play with Derry, and then if a, if a rematch was to be played, at least we were playing playing football um, and unfortunately it didn't unfold that way but um, yeah If I can take you back to a couple of weeks ago in the fog in Norrie because in fairness to Robbie Brennan and to Maliki after the game they both said look both sets of teams were there to play the game nobody was using it as any excuse the conditions that both teams had to uh, play with on the day but what was it like as a player out there like I'm assuming visibility probably wasn't too hot a few metres ahead of you Leaving Mahara here the, the skies were so blue, and I was like, Jesus, a lethal day for football. And once we got to Newry, even Belfast, the fog kicked in. And I was like, surely this is going to get better. But it didn't. First half was actually okay. You could see the opposite angle, the opposite goalposts, uh, which was which was fine. And that's obviously why Connor Lane went with, with the decision to play the game. So he was right in terms of playing the match, but the second half so they got worse and worse. And you couldn't really see the guts of, I say, 40, 50, 60 metres in front of you. So a kick pass that might have been on, you couldn't take it because you didn't know if it was a teammate or an opposition player. So it, it did play a, a few factors in the second half. That doesn't help either when you see your seven-point lead being eaten away by chemical croaks who were having that really good spell in the second half. And then they obviously start dropping the ball in for goals into the fog as well. And you're trying to just uh, withstand that. But that is something that you did very well towards the end of the game got your own goal and then were able to fight off their kind of second fight back right at the end of the game as well. It was a thrilling second half to watch as a neutral anyway. Yeah, I probably would have, but it wasn't that thrilling to, to play in it, to be honest. It, it was nerve-wracking. Um, when you have players like Walsh and Mannion, um, they could flip a game on its, on its head and, that, and that's exactly what they did. Mannion's couple of points in the second half, Walsh's goal, or Walsh's assist, sorry. Um, here, look, at, we, we knew it was going to be a close game and it, and it, it obviously ended up that way and this weekend is going to be no different in, in the Bridges game. You mentioned Bridgets and quite a few of their players. Uh, Tommy was joking last week, it was almost the Jim Gavin tactic where you had nearly a player on every line of the pitch ready to talk about how good St. Bridges were. Have you done <laughs> research on St. Bridges ahead of the final, um, given that you had a few players to reel off when you were chatting to Ashling on the pitch after the game finished in two, uh, two weeks ago? Yeah, you're always you're always obviously going to do opposition analysis. That's that's natural for any, I guess, high high performance environment. Um, the the boys that I named off were obviously the Ross Common fellas that I, I would have played against in Division Two. Um, and here, look, they, they are the most informed team in the country. If you look back at their the three performances, um, the last whatever the last month or so, like they dismantled Cor Finn. Uh, within 10 minutes in the first half, which Corf and were obviously tipped to win the All-Ireland at the stage. So here, they're, as I said, the most informed team in the country and they have serious inter-county players and their main club players. So it's it's going to require a better performance this weekend than what we did against Crooks. Connor, how are you? Tommy here. Um, I was at the Junior Intermediate Finals at the weekend of football and as I was doing the post-match interview with John Evans, I noticed a team warming up behind me. The Bridges boys got their 20 minutes in Crow Park. Did you decide not to do that this year in Glen? I know you did it last year. Yeah, we got our we had the opportunity to do it. Um, mm. Just with schedule-wise this week, we, could, we couldn't really fit it in. Um, and probably the experiences of last year, like we got two runs out, two runs out in Crow Park against Mike Cullen and Crooks last year. So we felt that we just rather focus on like we've obviously trained in Glen, trained in Old Bay the last couple of months. So just keep it, keep it same and keep it, um, yeah, a similar build up to what it's been. Yeah, that makes sense. Just using time as well as you can, I suppose. And like looking at the teams, the addition of Kieran McFall has been a big one. It's pretty much a very similar team as to what you had last year as well in terms of the group that has been driving this forward. Yeah, we've been lucky to withhold everyone um, from last year and obviously add McFall, who would start in any inter-county team. Um, so here, that's, that shows the focus that we have within the club and the drive to to, to go one step further this year. Um, people could easily just went, right, 
we didn't succeed last year. I'm going, I'm going traveling or I'm, I'm doing something else or I can't commit, but that wasn't the focus. Uh, we had our two, two or three months off after, as I, as I spoke about before, and the boys were ready to get back to work. Um, you touched on the addition of Kieran McFall. Last year, um, like you're in such a, a mindset of and what you can control. So like we didn't really think too much about it, but you look at the, the addition of him this year, it's massive and he's played serious performances over the last month. And hopefully he can, he can put in another good one now in, in Kruger. Yeah, you can see what he's adding to the team. Um, just two quick ones, Connor. Like emotion was a big thing. I know you, you did exceptionally well ahead of the Crokes game to keep that in check and put a brilliant performance in and get over the line. I was talking to Kevin Hughes yesterday of Tyrone at the Lake Regale launch. He's a, an episode coming. And we spoke a little bit about beating Kerry in the All-Ireland semi-final in 2003. They still had Armagh to get over in the All-Ireland final uh, a couple of weeks later. Emotion was a big thing in keeping it in check. He said the fact that there was a massive rivalry there with Armagh meant that there was no chance they were getting carried away. Yeah. How have you boys dealt with the emotion all year long? Because it's been a big factor this year, given how last year ended. Um, yeah, we could have easily stepped into... Uh, we could easily got ahead of ourselves after the Crooks game. Um, the the typical pitch invasions of the fans coming on and celebrating after as if it was like a, a, a final um against Crooks. But Porter and Malky were clicked on our case to they like, we probably stayed in the pitch for two or three minutes and straight into the change room because at the end of the day it was only a semi final and we haven't won anything. Um so we aren't stepping into that mindset of um just because we beat the Rain and Iron champions and rectified last year doesn't mean that we deserve to win now this weekend. Like Bridges are they're, they're in the exact same position as us. Um, they deserve to be there as well. So, um, and we 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 completely know that, and that comes from experiences over the last five, ten years of Malachi and, and Ryan and the players that we do have to to not get ahead of ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing we've we've chatted about, and we've not let slip in to the, the team. Connor is the experience of last year and the final potentially. A bit of a help, given that you know the Roscommon lads with St. Bridget's, uh, most of them would have been in the crowd when they won the All Ireland back in 2013. So they haven't had the chance to play in an All Ireland final themselves. While, as you say, you decided not to go for the kind of warm up session at Crow Park the week before this time around because you're maybe that bit more familiar with it. But also potentially that more familiarity about the occasion, having played in an All Ireland final 12 months ago. Yeah, just the experiences of last year are are, is, is, are going to be fantastic for us. Like. Whether I'd be staying down the night before, traveling down the day of, um, going into Crook Park. A lot of our players have obviously played there now. Um, but here, I have no doubt the Bridges boys have played many of the games in Crook Park, whether it be at minor level, under 20 or senior for Ross Common. Um, they won the Ireland Club Championship a decade ago. So I don't know how many players they have left from that team in this panel. Um, but they'll have I the experiences of knowledge in the club. To, to pass down to the players, so I would say it. It doesn't. I, I, I wouldn't say it gives an advantage, but um, it definitely helps in, in terms of our preparation. Well, I can tell you, Connor, they have one fella who's starting from the 2013 win ten years ago. But Benny, yes, that uh, day, Roman Stack. <laughs> Roman Stack's the one good man. But that day, at half time in the All Ireland final between Bridges and Ballymun Kickhams, I think about eleven of the lads played in the go the go games half time game. So. You've got the, the younger lads that have had that little bit of experience as well. So don't take that for granted. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I remember back in the day playing Go Games as well. So it's, yeah, it's a unique yeah. experience. And, uh, I have no doubt those boys have put in a better performance uh, this weekend than they would, would have in, at half time. Connor, just one last one before we let you get away and enjoy the rest of the week's preparation ahead of the final. Where does the energy come from? Is it good conditioning where you guys are pressing right up on Kilmacud and eventually that leads to the turnover for your goal, uh, which was so crucial in the semi-final? Because it would be energy sapping with some of the defending that you had to do in the second half, but you were pushing up as a team full press on their kick out right up to injury time within the game. Uh, conditioning and just having the courage to go for it. Um, we had that one point advantage, so we could have easily drop to the 45 or drop to our own half <clears throat> and try to enforce a turnover. But it's having that courage to to go in and win the game, not wait for them to make a mistake. Um, and thankfully, Ethan was able to force that turnover.
Yeah, because I think naturally most teams would have went and said, we're going to protect with numbers. You come and try and break us down. Worst comes to worst, you get a shot, potentially at a point to send it extra time. Like it takes a real bravery to decide if we push up and maybe potentially they get a good pass out, the field could have opened up for them further down the pitch. Yeah, that, and that's that's the risk we were willing to take. Um, you can prepare for those sort of scenarios in training, uh, but until you actually get there in a game against an actual opposition, you don't know really what what to do. Like opposition, opposition can set up different as well. Like so, you don't really know what you want to do until that moment. But after that free went over, um, the free obviously played a part in, in terms of it like, gave us time to set up and, and press up. So there, there's different factors that come into play um, in those sort of scenarios. Well, look, the reward was a, a trip to the All Ireland final for this weekend against St. Bridget's. Connor, thanks a million for joining us on the show, and best of luck uh, handling the nerves and everything else getting ready for this weekend. Thanks very much, lads. Thanks for having me on. That's much, right. Connor. Good luck. Glass there of uh, Glenn and of Derry, of course. And uh, Tommy, I do find it interesting that probably everyone we talked to, if we were to sit down with the stacks right now and talk about St. Bridget's, they would say Glenn have to be favourites because of the fact they've beaten Kilmer Crokes and all the experience. Um, the Glen Camp will tell us, well, you know, St. Bridges are playing some of the best football around. They're the form team in the country right now. I was having a look at the Roscommon Herald just before we came on air, and they were saying that Glen are massive favourites, and this is St. Bridges trying to create a big upset. So I think no matter what way you go, and I'm sure this is true of the hurling final as well, the narrative will always be, I think, I think there's a tip towards the other team here. Uh, you can spin it, Will, whatever way you want. Whatever way that suits the dressing room, I think you can spin it. But I, I do think that we're in for a cracking football final. Like that, I think that's a guarantee. And I do think it's fair to say, on one hand, that Glenn are favourites. Like, they have been consistently exceptional for the last two years. And this is quite a relatively young St. Bridget's team. It's a new generation. But don't forget that this is a generation in St. Bridget's that they've had earmarked for quite a while. If they don't get over the line this year... You know, you would not bet against them. And I know how difficult it is to win your club championship and then a Connacht, but you would not bet against this generation of St. Bridges players being back in the mix again. That being said, you get a chance for an All-Ireland final, you've got to be ready to take it. And uh, I, that's why I think it, it's going to be just a cracking match-up this weekend and uh, really looking forward to it. But uh, you're right, you can spin it whatever way you want. Like, as far as the two teams go, there might well be a bit of adapting against each other here because... As we've seen at various stages, Glenn are excellent at forcing the agenda and pushing up on you and making it very difficult to play. St. Bridget's, they tend to like playing on the counter-attack as well. And when they went that way the last day, they were actually very effective at times against Castlehaven on the counter-attack too. I wonder which team tries to uh, force the agenda in this game or will both teams be happy enough maybe to feel each other out a little bit? Because when these uh, matchups are so new sometimes, it's difficult to see how the teams are going to shape up against each other. Yeah, it, it it is it is difficult to see, but like I've watched Bridges now a couple of times, and I don't know why they change their approach in the sense that they're all blood and thunder for the first 15, 20 minutes, and they set the tone. And Corfin and Castlehaven, for different reasons, Corfin just seemed flat. Castlehaven, I think, were carrying a lot of injuries into that semi final. Neither of them could just neither of them could just really swing the momentum back in their favour in those games. Um, and St Bridges, once they had that great start, as you said, they're so clinical playing on the counter. Um, so I, I, I do think that Bridges probably need a fast start. They probably need to get in and rattle Glenn early doors. And then, you know, the ghosts of last year might begin to set in a little bit. And then, you you know, you're on top and you've got that buzz and you're you're young and there's a bit of abandon and, and that team, that electricity through the team is going to keep going. Um, I do think, like, the midfields, Glass and Bradley, top-class operators, but Shane Canan and Eddie Nolan have done really well all year long. They're put inter-county footballers, you know, they're in and around the, the Roscommon side. Me, like Warnock did an unbelievable job on uh, Shane Walsh the last day. Is he the man for Ben O'Carroll? You know, is he the man to match up there? I, I don't know. Is is that a, a natural matchup? Like Warnock obviously kicked a point on Walsh and did quite well for the majority of that game. Ben O'Carroll has just been such a handful, you know, all year long. Um, so that's just going to be a really interesting one as well. Yeah, I know. I can't wait for that final. I mean, I, I don't know who to tip. I think, in my mind, maybe Glenn would be marginal favourites going into this one. But if Bridges do what they've done the last two games, come out flying and build a bit of a lead, it becomes intriguing and they've got every chance with the talent that they've got across that pitch as well. I don't know. How do you see it going at the weekend? Yeah, I've been mean, a very similar boat to yourself. Um, like, I felt like Glenn have been so mature all year long. They've just been so clinical watching them closely in Ulster um, in their semi-final they're just like a team on a mission that are just getting the job done 
but I've been at a couple of the Bridget's games and I've seen them up close. And Connor Glass spoke about running off the field at the end of the semi final after two or three minutes, not wanting to get caught up in the occasion. St. Bridget's were in the exact same boat. I spoke to Brian Stack after the Connacht final. I spoke to him after the All Ireland semi final, and it was like two different people. Do you know, it, just it, there was there was that bit of elation after beating Carfield and getting over the line, and it was like a young team winning their first game um, or their first provincial title. And then once they just got through Castlehaven and Castlehaven nearly came back at them, there was just that relief, right? There's another job here to be done, um, and I think they're both going into it uh, in a really good place. Connor Glass says they're the best form team in the country I don't know like they're both in really good form you know it's just so hard to call it but I will I probably will be leaning towards Glenn and I'll probably stick that way and then I might waver a little bit as the weekend gets a bit closer all right you were there last Sunday for the club football yeah. finals at junior and intermediate if I can ask about Arava first because what remarkable yeah. scenes uh, when the game came to an end and you know Cavan's long wait for a win at Crow Park in an All-Ireland final after they beat Listowel who were seen as the heavy favourites going into that final as well yeah, Listowel were certainly seen as the favourites, but speaking to people in, in and around Cavan and just knowing some of the players in that Arva team and seeing the manner in which they had dispatched all their opposition on the way to the final, you just knew they had a really, really good chance. I actually felt like they were going to get the job done against Listowel. Um, to be honest, I hadn't seen a huge amount of Listowel. Uh, I'd seen highlights of the Valley McGillia game and been following them, but they were getting through games. They were conceding so little. Two points here, one three in another game uh, once they got out of Kerry. So... Look, the difference in both of those finals will at the weekend, um, and you, you probably saw the same in the Hurling, was the senior players, like Kieran Brady, and it, actually the man beside him in midfield, Tristan Hoek, Hoffman, uh, uh, Tristan Noah Hoffman, German-born, has a soccer background, only back playing the last couple of years, uh, Gaelic football with Arva. He was in midfield with Brady, like, God, like very, very impressive um, footballer. Kicked two points off his left, and uh, Brady fisted over the first, kicked another three. They were the, the, the winning of this game and you could tell that the stole tried to stop them early doors. Uh, Dara Leahy got a booking for taking down uh, Hoffman off the ball after I think a minute. Hoffman was booked as well but like Hoffman was taken down a few times after that and he, he didn't get caught for it so I think Leahy was whipped off at half time because they were in a bit of bother with that and then the lads just took over in the second half and in the other game like John Evans afterwards was he wasn't lost for words because I don't think John Evans has ever lost for words but I think he felt like his side killing the march had frozen a wee bit. And, uh, you know, they've had some very impressive footballers all year long. Daniel Deneen just, it just didn't click for him on the day. Um, and they, I think they had 16 wides. We've, we've spoken all about it. Aidan Nugent, 1-3. Jason Duffy, a point, man of the match. They had Ross McQuillan buzzing around the half-forward line too. The senior players made the difference, I think, in both finals at the weekend. Yeah, and look, it sets up this potential... Ulster treble if Glenn were to win because you know Cully Hanna Arva yeah. potentially now Glenn which would be the first time that would ever be done if it was wow, to be a, okay. an Ulster treble as well so um, history potentially awaits there Kilkenny looking for a treble in the hurling too after the wins for Tuller Ross Birkin and for Thomastown and now it's going to be O'Loughlin Gales looking to complete that but St Thomas's of Galway stand in their way delighted to say we've got St Thomas's uh, defender Finton Burke with us now Finton how are you getting on are you well? Not too bad knowing yourselves that's your luck. It's all Ireland final week. Um, I don't know how the week how would you be? is shaping up for you. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's grand for us to have a bit of a chat about it. You has to uh, come off the back of, I suppose, the best place for me to start is that remarkable all Ireland semi final that you guys had with Bally Gunner a month ago now at this stage. Uh, it was some match to watch. I don't know what it was like as a match to play in. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's one of those games that you don't realise kind of what sort of game it is until you go home or until you're on the way home and you kind of see social media is kicking off about it and probably the next day when you watch it back you realise probably how much of a game or how good of a game it was. Like thrilling finish, both sides had to come up with points to send it to extra time in the first place and then when you had lads who were effectively on fumes still putting over wonderful scores from difficult angles uh, to send the game to penalties, um, you could see just the sheer quality that was there and it was quality that you knew you were going to have to produce on the day as well because that Bally Gunner team coming in off their 10 Waterford Championships off the back of three Munsters, given they were the favourites for the All-Ireland Championship when you played them as well, you knew you were going to have to bring your absolute best to get over them. Yeah, obviously we knew going down that that nothing, anything short of our best wasn't going to do. And we probably got lucky on the day. We probably got a score or two when they started to go ahead. We, we pegged it back and lucky and unlucky probably to win and we could have lost the game just as easy. Well, like you're on this wonderful run yourselves, having won... Quite a few of you around the panel, eight Galway titles at this stage, six in a row at this stage within the county. 
you know, going to All Ireland semi finals and finals and coming up close. If it wasn't for TJ Reid hitting the top corner, you could have had an All Ireland that year. But were you driven on a little bit by what would have, I suppose, been a disappointment to lose out to Dunloy in a semi final last year? Yeah, I suppose there's a lot of motivating factors. That is part of it. And I've been written off a small bit against Ballygunner, was obviously another small bit, but it's it's bits and pieces like that that you use probably throughout the years that 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 you use that for the motivation for every game. And look, I suppose you're no shortage of motivation given how close you've gone. I was speaking top of the show about uh, 2013 when you got that win against Cormac Kalahi in an All-Ireland final. Given you've been so close in the years since, how high are the determination levels around St. Thomas's now uh, to try and get your hands on the Tommy Moore at the weekend? Yeah, obviously there's a, there's a good few of us now on the panel that don't have a, don't have an All Ireland medal with the club. Like, so it's probably there's a lot of it that the younger lads are kind of driving it as much as the older lads at this stage, just to try and get their hands on that elusive medal. James Skell, I was chatting to him in the hurling pod last night. He said he's never seen you step up to take a penalty. So he was wondering what you were doing taking a penalty in the shootout. Now Stephen O'Keefe saved it very impressively. Had you put yourself forward early on to take a penalty, or did you have an idea what the the penalty lineout was going to look like? Yeah, obviously we would have been kind of messing around the training before and after training hitting penalties and I would have been hitting them more out of boredom than anything. But I was probably scoring a few of them and Kenneth just asked me after the game, he said, are you good to hit one? And I said, yeah, I should. I don't know if I will hit one and see what happens. But yeah, I obviously went left. I thought our well, first two went left, so I thought Keith might be expecting me to kind of go back on, go back right to probably didn't strike it unbelievably well, but I still thought it was good enough to go in. And in fairness, O'Keefe is a hard man to beat if you put it into the top corner anyway. So anywhere short of that, he's going to block it. Well, you're going to back your own technique. I mean, you Joe Canning wooing a couple of years ago when you were hitting over sidelines, not just on the left side, but on the right side. I don't know whether we call you an ambidextrous uh, sideline cut taker. I'm not sure if that's how you define yourself, but um, the kind of Ronnie O'Sullivan of sideline taking you've made yourself now. Yeah, I don't know about that now, but playing full back, you don't really get to take too many. It's a bit boring sitting standing back there doing nothing, but... Um, yeah, look, I suppose if, if, if the ball is left down to well hit it and just hope it gets up out of the, out of the, out of the ground. Well, like, I mean, how do you get how do you get good at that? Fenton? Yeah. Um, well, obviously practice, but I probably don't. I don't really practice them now. To be honest with you, I'd never really like. I'd never go to the pitch and hit sidelines. It's probably something yeah. I practice as a young lad, with showing your seven or eight years of age going up to the pitch, poking around and stuff. It's just something you practice, and it's just something I've probably never forgotten. Really, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. Something just clicked, I suppose, did it? Yeah, it's, it's like there's, it's, there's not so much to think about it. All you have to do is, like, if you get low enough and hit it with the right part of the hurdle, ninety percent of the time it goes in the right direction. Like, so it's, it's more nearly just constantly trying to get that technique right, and and most of the time it works. In fairness, well, like genuinely, when it comes to that technique, to be able to do it off both sides is unique and remarkable. Like, I know loads of guys who can hit good sidelines on one side, but will probably struggle to get it off the ground on the other side. So. I was actually assuming you must do a ridiculous amount of practice at this, but you're saying you don't. No, I know, and I like I'd never practice my training or anything. If maybe if the lads were messing before we're training, I'd stand up and sat one over and walk away just an idle as well. But it's just something when I was younger, I realised say if you take it off your left, it, it curls in to the left, say, and if you take it off your right, it curls in towards the right. And it's very difficult say to fade the ball if you're striking it on your wrong side on the wrong side of the pitch, the ball is curling away from goal. So it just made more sense to me to be able to to curl them in from both sides and I suppose it just, it's just something I learned and in fairness it, it stuck with me thank God Yeah it's a handy skill it's one maybe for fancy hurling if people are selecting players uh, coming into this year as well that might be handy when you go back in with Galway as well I mean can you talk to me about David's efforts to get back out onto the pitch because I remember before the inter-county season we were all expecting that was going to be a 12-monther because it was a cruciate ligament and then the boost that must have given you to have him back for the county final and then also to have him coming back now to full fitness and to full form ahead of an All Ireland final as well, like realistically well ahead of schedule in his recovery. Yeah, absolutely. And like everybody knows what David Work brings to the team, even if he wasn't playing. But I suppose it, it, we didn't notice it as much inside in the group because it's like he never left. He was kind of at at the majority of training sessions, whether it be in the gym or, or doing his bit of running. So he was always there with a few five words of encouragement, or or he was there to give lads a good telling off if he thought the standards were dropping so it almost felt like he wasn't really away from the group as such but coming down the home straight I suppose quarterfinals and, and semi-finals when you see him togged out and ready to go it, it's a big lift or when things are kind of 10 minutes to go when you're kind of hitting that lull just to bring him on it's probably more of a mental lift than, than anything else but it definitely helps the team yeah. Mm. 
It sure helps as well. And when you're getting ready to go to Crow Park, you have a guy who's got experience of hitting him on the big day as well. Like just how unerring Conor Cooney has been with the freeze. 14 points the last day, 13 of them coming from dead balls. Where you know if a Lachlan Gales are going to give away a free, Conor is there to pop them over. Yeah, like uh, we probably more so noticed it with the club, like, but I'd say the majority of lads would say Conor is probably the best hurler we've, a lot of us have ever hurled with, to be honest with you. Like day in, day out, he's just hitting standards and he, the work rate, not alone the scores he gets, but probably the work he does that he doesn't get the justification for is. It's probably it's actually a pity really because it's things he does off the ball track and runners or like it's often a time that say if they the team got a run on you and there'd be an overlap and he'd be the lad that'll come back and and break it up and you know it, it's more so the work rate that he brings to the team obviously the frees are, are helping and he's finds some play but his work rate is just as good and just as valuable as the rest of it. How valuable is his leadership as well? Because it's rare that you get someone who's been a a club captain for as long as he has been and a club captain from a reasonably young age when he came in as well. So I'm assuming he must have a huge leadership role within St. Thomas's. Yeah, and anyone that knows Connor knows he isn't that vocal. Like, he wouldn't really, he wouldn't be much of a talker, but when he talks, you listen to that kind of a, a character. But no, he does his talking on the field and all you have to do is go to one any of our club games and you'll see that. Like So all lads do is literally just follow in his footsteps. If, if Connor's doing something, lads just start doing it and it's probably a massive help for younger lads coming in learning off that yeah I'm looking forward to seeing the battle potentially between him and Paddy Deegan depending on whether he kind of stays around that 11 channel or whether he moves around a bit at the weekend O'Loughlin Gales what's been your kind of take on them so far this year because this is a team who have won a lot of big games by a point the Kilkenny final the Leinster final and then a point against Cushendall the last day as well yeah I suppose scorelines we wouldn't really focus on scorelines because a win is a win no matter how you get it or, or how much you win it by but Obviously, any team that comes out of Kilkenny and, and beats Ballyhale and, and gets through Leinster and then beats Cushion Dahl is obviously going to be a force to be reckoned with. Tommy mentioned there already about how county players were very much to the fore in the intermediate and junior finals last weekend. I think about a Lachlan Gales. There's very few teams who can boast three county players in key positions around their defence in having Hugh Lawler and Paddy Deegan right down the middle and then having one of the best man markers in the country and Mikey Butler a cornerback as well. It's, uh, it's some prospect to try and break down that defence, isn't it? Yeah, I think the five or six of their backs are in the Kilkenny panel now at the moment. Like so, I suppose it's a big it's a big task for well, all of us, but more so our forwards to try break that down and try come up with something different that'll that'll unsettle them a small bit. Mm. How are you finding the preparations get ready for this year? Because as you mentioned, you've been in All Ireland finals and particularly in All Ireland semi finals so so much in recent times. Like, does it change year by year, or does it help to have that experience of the last six seasons behind you now? Yeah, I suppose the experience is obviously it's obviously a help, like, but like it's hard enough probably to manage the Christmas break and such and like we know there's a lot more important things obviously than hurling and family and friends are more important over Christmas. So, so say take a few days, we took a few days over Christmas and stuff and lads did their own few bits and we did one or two training sessions, a bit of run and burn off the Christmas dinner and get back then kind of first or second of January and just drive it on. I always wonder is that a difficult thing to do? Because you say second week of January you win an all Ireland or second week of December, I should say, you win an All-Ireland semi-final in the hurling, you have to wait until the third week of January then to play the final. Well, in the case of the football teams, in a way, I know you have to manage the Christmas in a different way to be back out and to be peaking for early January for an All-Ireland semi-final. But at least you're that bit closer to having played a competitive game when you go to the All-Ireland final. Is it tricky to actually manage that four or five weeks in between the two games? If you win the match, it's, it was easy to manage. And if you lose the match, it was hard to manage. Do you know the sort of way it's... <laughs> I wouldn't say like it's it's the same for both teams. It's you know you kind of just get on with it. If 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 you feel like you've extra work to do as a player, you get that extra work done in that block. Or if you feel like you know you've you've a lot done or you need a bit of time off, you can leave down the hurl for a week or two. And you know it's kind of it, it's it's up to the players really how they they get through that kind of block. Mm. I remember the scenes when you won the championship in the 2012-2013 season. Um, at that stage, I suppose were you you were probably. A bit, you were a bit too young to be around about then. What were you doing in Crow Park that day? <laughs> I was sitting in the queues with my face painted red and blue, <laughs> screaming like a young lad. Um, no, I was obviously good. Uh, I think it was 15 or 16. Yeah. It was 15. Okay. So, like, it's it's kind of nice to nearly know the other side of it. So you know what the emotions are going to be in the stand and you know how much it means to spectators and supporters. 
so it nearly gives you that extra bit of, of drive when you're out there to know you know what you're doing it for and it's more than just the team that are on the field it's the people that are in the stand as well yeah what are your memories of the day itself aside from shouting like you uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it was uh, Paddy's day we got the bus in we organised the bus a lot of young lads end up on the bus bus got stuck in traffic so we had to get off the bus about three miles from Crow Park leg it in miss the warm up just came in on time but it's nearly a bit of a blur. You're so you're so excited and just. I remember it was a tight enough game. I think they got one or two lads sent off, kind of come up towards the end and won by a couple of points. But you're just you're nearly delirious with excitement. You're just kind of thinking back now. You you remember the home coming and the lads coming home, getting off the bus and stuff. And it was probably so surreal. You didn't really nearly realize what was going on or or how monumental it actually was on the day. Mm. Fenton, we were talking to Conor Glass about this a little earlier on. When you get over the line in a semi-final and, and I suppose the narrative that was there after last year for them, Will has mentioned the epic that you won against Bally Gunner and I suppose the heartbreak that you've suffered in different ways over the last couple of years at this stage. I know it's not easy all Ireland final week talking to the media and, and, and having to express yourself, but how do you bottle, I suppose, the, the, the pressure and knowing that this is an unbelievable opportunity on a week like this? Yeah, personally, I suppose I can only speak for myself, but I wouldn't really feel the pressure or, or, or even try bottle it. I think like days like this don't come around too often and they're not going to come around too often. So I think you kind of have to embrace it and probably try to find the balance between talking to people about hurling, getting caught up in the occasion, but trying to keep your mind at the task at hand because, like as I said, like this this might never happen again. You know, you have to. I don't want to look back on on my career and say, oh, I didn't rightly enjoy that final. I was too focused on the match because, you know, we're human and it's hurling and it's what we love. Like so, I suppose trying to find the balance between enjoying it, getting caught up in it, but yet keeping your mind on, on task is probably the hardest part. Mm. I hate using the phrase learnings, but is there anything you can kind of take as a learning from when you played Ballyhale a few years ago in the All Ireland final? <laughs> Not really, to be honest. Like they were, they were just, outrageously good that day, in fairness. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and like we could make excuses that uh, the two boys were injured beforehand, and we had one or two injured during the day. But like we don't, you're not going to make excuses like that sort of way. So I suppose yes, the learnings you take are just you're kind of used to the day, and you know what the day is about. Is probably the only thing that is the, you're hoping the occasion won't be getting to you as much as it probably get to you on a day like that because you've done it before. Yeah. Um, again, I don't know exactly who you're going to end up marking because Lachlan Gales have, have generally gone with the big forward in there and kind of let Bergen sweep around and let him come out and be free as well. But it's going to be, I suppose, one of the things, again, we talk about how good Connor is. Mark Bergen has been very good with the freeze. He got four points from play the last day as well. He's one of those guys as a defence you're going to have to get a handle on this weekend. Yeah, I suppose it's very frustrating like when you're the team that they have and the calibre of players that they have that you mark Mark Bergen one day and another lad will pop up the next day or do you know it's going to be no more than ourselves you, you keep an eye on Connor and it could be Aina that pops up do you know so it's, it's probably intriguing that way trying to find the matchups and see who's going to pick who but as I said no matter which one of them pick up it's going to be another lad that'll pick up the slack Yeah and I suppose that brings me now nicely to my last question which is how much of a kind of a, a family link there is across St. Thomas's at the moment you've uh, just alluded to a few more Burks there we've mentioned Cooney's along the way as well I guess a bit like really the vast majority of clubs around the country, you've got a few kind of family bloodlines which are going right through the team there. Yeah, obviously there's, you said there's the few families that we mentioned and stuff, but there's probably families now, it's probably more, the last few years, it's probably spread more names, more families have come into it, say, and stuff, but it sounds cliche when you say it, but to be honest with you, a lot of, like, we've been hurling so long together and, and it's such a small community that that, that we nearly all feel like cousins anyway. If, if you get me, do you know the lads you'll be playing with and stuff, you've kind of six long years on the road together and you're you're nearly training year in, year out, that the bond is probably as close now and as tight as it ever was. Well, Fintan, look, best of luck getting ready for the final against O'Loughlin Gales at the weekend. And thanks a million for joining us on the show. No bother. Thanks a million, lads. Best wishes. There you go. I'm, I'm telling you, Tommy, keep an eye out on fancy hurling this year if you're doing it. You've got a defender who's able to put over sidelines, particularly the one he did the Gaelic rounds a couple of years ago, uh, doing ones from both sides. It's an incredible asset to have. It's a high high point scoring if someone puts over sidelines, even more if it's a defender who does it. There should be two points. There it's should like, be. And he, ta he talked down the skill there. Like, big time. Do you know, just, like I've seen plenty of top-class quality hurlers, and I see them all the time in Cratlow. 
Not too many of them that can hit a sideline like that. Well, the thing as well is, uh, so the reason I bring Canning up is because for me, Canning is the best sideline taker I've ever seen uh, because of his accuracy consistently from long range and what he can do. And he was saying that Finton's the best sideline taker he's ever seen. And to think, um, it's almost jealousy when you hear someone say they barely practice it and yet they're able to ping them over from long range on both sides. Yeah, well, something obviously clicked in his head when he was a kid. And I suppose it's like probably one of those things, if you're asked to describe it or explain what you're doing, you can't. It's kind of just ingrained in the body and it's kind of like an instinctive thing that he's doing. But yeah, no, it's very impressive. Maybe he just doesn't want to give it away. Maybe he's cracked the code and he doesn't want everyone else to find out how to do it. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. And again, like I think um, ultimately Stephen O'Keefe saves the penalty in the penalty shoot, but I think it takes balls for a fullback to decide I'm going to be one of the five set-piece takers who's going to go up and take a penalty in a penalty shootout. Um, yeah. I, I, look, I don't know what it's like to try and go into an All-Ireland semi-final. It's, it's amazing that night, it was like 10 o'clock, freezing cold in Port Leash, early December, you know that five people are going to stand up and take a penalty. Potentially, if you miss, it might cost your club a chance of going to Crow Park. Like, that's just ridiculous pressure. And this game at the weekend could go all the way as well. Like, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's very little separating these sides at the end of 60 minutes because O'Loughlin Gales have had this incredible skill, Tommy, all year, with the exception of, I know we were both at the kilcormick Lahi game in the semi-finals in Leinster and they had a good win against Mount Leinster Rangers. But kind of O'Loughlin Gales throughout the season... The big games, they've had to eke them out. That Deegan score to win the uh, Kilkenny final, the very late score from Bergen in the Leinster final, and then to have to come back from eight points down at the stage against Cushendall, show that little bit of fighting spirit and get a very late winner in the semi-final. Generally, they've been in dogfights. And like, I like the physical profile of this St. Thomas's team coming into it too. Like, aside from anything else, they gave Bally Gunner a right old battle, an old-fashioned battle in the semi-final as well. That's not to take away from the skill on either side, but St. Thomas has had that bit of physicality, had that bit of edge, that bit of hunger that's required to win a big game as well. So, I don't know. We talk about the football being a coin toss. This one is the ultimate coin toss. Yeah, is there a favourite at the minute? Or which way is it? Is it I think St. Thomas's are narrow favourites going into the final, but not by, it, like. not by a huge amount. Yeah, yeah, because like, as you said, like Olaf and Gales have that Phenomenal knack all year long of pulling it out of the fire. I think it was David Fogarty. Fogarty in the semi final. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that just, you know, and like Cushendall had those boys on the ropes a couple of times in that game and the energy and the noise coming from their fans, like they were up against it. But as you said, like when you've come through the Kilkenny Championship as they did, you must have unbelievable belief in your side. And uh, there's a, a top class operator there and Brian Hogan and steering them. Um, I think you're right. I think there's a chance this could go down to the wire. Uh, two different sides, you, you could say, in terms of the, the style in which they play and the manner in which they play. But, like, is it going to come, to come down to Cooney and Bergen, like? Who could, nails them It could, day, it could well do. Like, I mean, one of the things I really like about the Lachlan Gales team is their half-back line have got all the licence. I don't know whether it's because Brian Hogan is their manager, but you can go forward from that half-back line and play hurling. And generally... Their wing forwards and wing backs can almost end up in opposite positions at times on puckouts and when moves are happening. And then Paddy Deegan is given that license to roam. He scored five points in the Leinster final. But I just wonder if having Connor Cooney in that similar zone, I don't know if those two guys are going to go up against each other. There's always that chance that Connor might drift over into wide positions at times. He could drop a little bit deeper to get on the ball. I don't necessarily think that Paddy Deegan will go right up on him if that's the case. But I wonder will that impair. Deegan coming forward and kind of been the playmaker coming out of their defence because generally your Lachlan Gales have been able to do that because they know the house is so well minded when you've got Butler and Lawler in behind them. Yeah, I, I don't know if that will change Deegan's game. Like the manner in which he's played has been quite consistent all, all the year long, you know. Um he's kind of come up with big scores and they've needed him as well. He's come out of nowhere to hit a couple of big points in games. He's obviously so key to him. You, you you just don't think he'll follow him. You think he'll stay there in the centre of Defence, you don't think he'll, he'll I, track I, Cooney down? I think he'll want to play his own game. Like um, yeah. Paul Murphy compared it this week to almost like a Declan Hannon role, where he's the player that you went, you want to orchestrate play and you want the ball to be in Deegan's hand as often as you possibly can. So you don't want him to be getting dragged around into positions where he can't dictate the play when O'Loughlin Gales have the ball. So I think in an ideal circumstance, you'd want him to be on as much ball as possible. And they hurl to a system. Like I think they're very effective, they're hard to break down. They're very good when they get the ball themselves at creating space. And one of the things you get, I was in a, a good high position for that game between uh, Kilcormick Lai and O'Loughlin Gales. And I was sitting beside um, some of the KK management during the game as well. And they were just looking at how wide O'Loughlin Gales are at using the pitch. And the pitch is pretty much exactly the same size as Connor Park and Crow Park. That they were so good 
at narrowing the play when KK had the ball and then widening it when they got the ball themselves. So it's going to be intriguing to see how the teams adapt. And like in the case of St. Thomas, as we mentioned, the Finton, they've been to all Ireland finals, they've been to semi finals in recent years. They're battle hardened when it comes to these big days, which most of the O'Loughlin Gales team don't have. They weren't around when they lost out to Claren Bridge. Um, was it 13 years ago now at this stage in all Ireland final? So it's a new feeling for a lot of those players to have gone this deep into the championship. So I wonder if that's going to be a small factor going into the weekend as well. It, potentially, but like it's it's I suppose it's the way um, Fint and Burke said it earlier on. Like if you, if you win, it wasn't a factor. If if you don't win, you know you know it, it, it kind of that's the the winners are probably right history here. But like you look at the manner in which O'Loughlin and Gales you mentioned already have won so many of their games this year, and I just think that infuses so much belief in the team. And I think that momentum is probably more relevant than previous years and the hurt and maybe the heartbreak that St. Thomas has about the previous years because I think the momentum of this year and the campaign so far is tangible. I know there's a big gap between the semi-final and the final, but I think that's a tangible thing you can lean on. Whereas, I suppose we were trying to get out of there with Conor Glass and, and Fintan Burke. There's so much that's happened before and it's like, how do you park that? How do you park that and put your best performance out there on the, on the field? I don't know if there is a a kind of black and white answer for that but you know is that going to make a huge difference to St Thomas's? I, I don't know like I think it's I think it's the more recent uh, form that's going to be probably more of a factor Oh look and anyone in Lachlan Gales will be saying to me right now they were in Crow Park for a Leinster final where they had to win True. an arm wrestle just a couple of months ago yeah. so from their point of view they've got recent memories of going there and being successful as well and they've been through all the big occasion in the day as well should be two really good finals it's hurling up first from half past one and that's followed by the football at the weekend. I don't think either of us, Tommy, you're decided on who the two winners are going to be, which is a good place to be in ahead of the weekend. I think so, Will, yeah. Let's not commit yet. Right. We'll, we'll change our mind multiple times during the week. Uh, if you can't yeah. make it to Crow Park, both those games are on TG Carr on Sunday afternoon as well. That is the last in the series for us on the Club Championship. Thanks to Captain Murphy, particularly who's been producing throughout the series, Cameron Hill, uh, who helped us out as well. All of our contributors, uh, to Tommy and Dashing, who've been regular co-hosts over the last couple of months as well. The Club Championship show here on Off the Ball has been brought to you by AIB. They are the proud sponsors of the All-Ireland Club Championships in football, hurling and in camogie. And check out the hashtag the toughest going into this Sunday. The Club Championship Show on Off The Ball in partnership with AIB, proud sponsor of the Football, Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest.